Welcome to another presentation with information you'll find nowhere else. Our topic is a bacterium by the name Thecalibacterium prausitzii. Yes, I know it's a mouthful. Well, this bacteria literally is the superhero of the gut, with a better data profile than any other critter down there. You may say, wait a second, I take probiotics. I thought one of those species from Bifidobacterium or Lactobacillus would be the superhero. It's not even close. There are so many different species in the human microbiota, roughly 1,500 on average. Some are bad actors, some are a bit innocuous, some are conditional, some others are universal health promoters. So let's take a look at the gold standard for the health promoters. First, let's cover some background information. F. prausitzii is what's considered extremely oxygen sensitive. It survives for less than two minutes when exposed to the air. Therefore, it is hard to study. Plus, when you consider that this is a new field with improving technology, the data is somewhat limited. In fact, it wasn't until 2002 when this bacterium was reclassified into the genus Fecalibacterium from Fusobacterium, which is a genus filled with very different actors. For the past many years, it's been classified in the family Ruminococcaceae, but recently has been reclassified into Oslospiraceae. This genus has at least three other species, but I literally almost never see them identified, and therefore, I'll treat the genus and species as one and the same. Like all of the other amazing, oxygen-sensitive, health-promoting, bureau-producing bacteria, its preferred substrate comes from certain sugars, which are able to reach the colon, think fiber. In figure three, you can see from this paper, there are at least 27 different strains. A strain is a subcategory of species with some differences in fuel preferences, but with general consistencies. There are a number of one-off studies which show one thing or another influencing F. prausitzii. For example, in this study, berberine consumption resulted in a significant decrease in its abundance, most likely attributable to the antimicrobial nature of berberines. And in this study, the polyphenols from wine increased the abundance of F. prausitzii in both the wine with and without alcohol. Since F. prausitzii is not a phytochemical degrader, the likely result was from Acromantium mucinophila degrading the polyphenols and cross-feeding components of mucus. By far and away, there are two prebiotics which consistently show that they are able to increase the abundance of F. prausitzii. I have done a complete meta-analysis of all the major prebiotics and how they impact all the major bacteria in the intestinal microbiome. These studies are all human in vivo studies or humanized in vitro studies. One of those crucial prebiotics is inulin. Data shows that F. prausitzii is able to ferment inulin and its breakdown products, FOS and fructose. But if you consume fructose or FOS, the odds are very high they won't make it to the colon for any benefit. Therefore, the smarter idea is to administer the more complex prebiotic, inulin. Or you could also eat more onions, asparagus, and garlic. I even have listed the PMIDs, which are the reference numbers for the studies I'm citing here. The other key prebiotic I use to influence F. prausitzii levels is pectin. Again, the data is very consistent, especially given the limited amount of research that exists. Again, I have listed for you the PMID numbers if you want to check for yourself. Pectin is a very complex prebiotic, which will survive until it reaches the colon to yield benefit. I have an entire presentation dedicated to this amazing prebiotic on my website and my YouTube channel. Of course, pectin just doesn't feed F. prausitzii. Other bacteria possess the enzymatic machinery to access and ferment the sugars locked behind bonds. In Table 3, we can see a breakdown of the findings in regards to pectin. The thick blue arrow shows us that a number of strains from various bacteroides species degrade pectin something which has been proven over and over. The middle blue arrow shows that three out of five Eubacterium elegans strains were able to utilize pectin. E. elegans is another amazing health-promoting bacterium, which has been reclassified into the genus Lactospira. On the bottom, eight of the 10 F. prausitzii strains tested were able to utilize pectin. Therefore, not all strains, but most, can ferment it, which can lead to individual variability among patients. What you don't want to do is follow the low FODMAPS diet. 
Again, I have a presentation dedicated to this topic as well. This diet excludes both inulin and pectin, which virtually eliminates the fuel supply for F. prausitzii to thrive. What a terrible idea. Here I show all of the studies I could find in regards to this crazy diet and its effect on the microbiome. In red, I've circled the studies that showed a significant reduction in F. prausitzii caused by this diet. What you also need to know is many of these studies are limited in scope. PCR technology was used in five of these studies. PCR means that they are only looking at a very small specific number of bacteria. For example, in the first row, they only use primers for three bacteria. So they have no data points on over 1,000 other species. If better technology was used, how much more proof will we have? Now let's switch gears and look at another type of meta-analysis, which I've been busy doing for many years. During and since my time as director of medical education for a microbiome firm, I've analyzed all of the human fecal microbiome data for all of the most common diseases and conditions. In my database, I have all the data points for each study when a significant difference was found between the healthy controls and the cohort with a given condition. Here you can see across the x-axis most of the conditions I've analyzed to date. On the y-axis is the count and the number of studies. Here we're looking at a classic bad-acting genus, a Asherashia. That's where E. coli comes from. As you can see, almost 100% of the time, when a significant difference is found between healthy controls and the unhealthy, the unhealthy have more of these bacteria in their microbiome, as evidenced by the color orange. These data points tell us that very consistently across all conditions, the genus of Asherashia is higher in the sick, or said differently, lower in the healthy. In other words, kept in check. The opposite profile is that of F. prausitzii. As you can see, it is almost all green. That is to say, when a significant difference was found between the healthy controls and those with a given condition, almost all of the time, the healthy controls had more F. prausitzii in their microbiomes. This data is the most consistent, combined with the most data points, among any other bacteria in the gut. Now let's take a look at some of those conditions individually. In each one of these slides you're about to see, I'm graphing the keystone taxa for the respective condition, the microbial fingerprint, if you will. Here we see classic results. There are opportunistic pathogens which are significantly higher in anxiety and depression, bad actors like Agrothella and Streptococcus, while the classic health promoters are significantly reduced such as Carpococcus, and highlighted in blue, F. prausitzii, which literally has the most data points, and 100% of the time is significantly higher in healthy controls. We see much the same here for dementia. Out of eight studies where a significant difference was found, seven showed F. prausitzii to be higher in healthy controls versus those subjects with dementia. How about Parkinson's disease? The same story. F. prausitzii is one of the key members of this microbial signature, with again, 100% of the time, it being significantly higher in healthy controls versus those subjects with Parkinson's. And in healthy aging, we see much the same picture. In 11 out of 12 studies, F. prausitzii was significantly higher in the non-frail and young versus the old and frail. How about IBS? Once again, it is one of the defining members of this microbial signature. It's always higher in healthy controls versus those subjects with IBS. If you have IBS, don't you want more of what the healthy people have? And again, we see more of the same in colorectal cancer and in COVID and in IBD, which is Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. In fact, once again, F. prausitzii is the defining species of the microbial fingerprint with the most data points. And lastly, we see the same story in C. diff infections, which is dysbiosis in the extreme. It is this bacterium, along with others, which keep the microbiome and you healthy. If these health promoters are reduced due to antibiotics, PPIs, and or bad diet, then the opportunistic pathogens become opportunistic. 
That's a recipe for disease. This is a slide you'll be seeing often in my presentations. This is the accumulation of thousands of hours of work determining the key players in the microbiome. Collected here are the great universal or almost universal health-promoting taxa of the gut. These health-promoting bacteria have been found to be consistently, significantly higher in healthier cohorts and significantly lower in the unhealthy ones across all diseases. You just saw most of them in the graphs I just showed you. The darker the green, the stronger the data as a health promoter. Out of a thousand or more species in your gut, this handful plays an enormous role in your health. There are a few health promoting genera not listed here, like Bifidobacterium, Allostypes, and Odoribacter, which are in other phyla, but these listed here are the main determinants of health in the gut. These incredible bacteria listed can occupy a lot of real estate and perform many health promoting functions beyond the highly beneficial one of beta reproduction. The skeptics out there will say, okay, Mr. Microbiome Expert, I know you have all this amazing data compiled, which demonstrates that it is statistically impossible for F. prausitzii to be nothing but a health promoter, but association does not equal causation. Okay, then let's take a look at causation. Figure two gives us a summary of things going on in the gut. It starts with beauty producers up top, of which F. prausitzii is one. In fact, on average, it's the most prolific one. Butyrate is one of the most important compounds in our bodies. It's critically important to our health, and I'll be launching a dedicated presentation to it. There are many benefits from F. prausitzii which are due to this butyrate production, and in fact, at times, it's difficult to discern if the benefit was from the butyrate or some other component of the bacterium. With that said, for the remaining slides, I'll focus on the non-butyrate benefits, or said differently, the direct benefits. I realize that this is a bit complex, especially the immune system, which is just mind-boggling. So I'll try to keep it understandable. f prozitzii has been shown to be anti-inflammatory, affecting several components of the immune system. This is a good thing, as inflammation is at the core of most, if not all, disease. One direct benefit of f prozitzii is that its extracellular vesicles define the box have been shown to reduce levels of several pro-inflammatory cytokines, as cytokine is a messenger-like component of the immune system. Most are inflammatory, as you can imagine, as they are sounding the alarm of alert, alert, invader, invader. But some exist to damper the immune response, like interleukin-10, which we'll see shortly. These extracellular vesicles of Aftrosaceae have been shown to help with gut permeability. You see, bad actors do a number of things, one of which is to separate the cells that line our gut, which are held together with a scaffolding-like structure here. Gut permeability is a bad thing, and thus maintaining its integrity is a good thing. In regards to the interleukin-10 just mentioned, some unknown component of f prausitzii increases its abundance, dependent on strain, while at the same time decreasing the abundance of pro-inflammatory components of the immune system, as shown in A, and B. Also from this paper is that they found no antimicrobial benefit. Some health-promoting bacteria actually actively kill other bacteria, but that is not the case here. However, indirectly, via butyrate production, it does. In much the same theme previously, these researchers also found that a component of F. prausitzii significantly increases interleukin-10, far beyond other bacteria as shown in D. Additionally, they also found no antibacterial properties like the others. And very interestingly, in Figure 7, when colitis was induced in mice, when the supernatant, see the definition, was injected into the mice, their survival rate was wildly more successful than the other methods. There is some non-butyrate compound yet to be identified that is highly beneficial. One molecule which has been identified is what's called a MAM protein microbial anti-inflammatory molecule. The molecule is only produced by F. prausitzii. It's able to block a key aspect of inflammation, something called NF-kappa-beta. This MAM protein has also been shown to maintain the gut barrier. So what is the gut barrier? Yeah. 
Think of it as your skin, but on the inside. Your skin keeps out all sorts of potential invaders from gaining access to the inside of you. What if your skin had many small lesions? Then how protective would it be? Well, the same is true in the gut, only more complex. When we ingest foods, many different pathogens can and are a part of the meal. In addition, the amount of bacteria which reside in the gut is enormous. They all just can't have access to the rest of you. Your GI tract needs to break down and absorb the nutrients, while at the same time sort out the rest of the players. For good reason, some 80% of our immune system lines the gut. It's the primary route for an invasion, and bad bugs have developed ways to break through the castle wall and gain access to you. So F. prausitii is helping keep the wall standing. Another thing that F. prausitii has been shown to directly do is affect serotonin function. By now, everybody knows what serotonin is, usually thought of in terms of mood and sleep. But serotonin also plays many roles in the gut. In fact, most of all the serotonin in the body is found in the gut. Serotonin in the gut is transferred by what's called serotonin transporters. As we can see here, both F. prausitii and its supernatant, that's their word again, were shown to significantly increase the gene expression for CERT. In other words, make more of it. Lastly, in this paper, the researchers found that F. prausitii makes salicylic acid. Think aspirin. That's right, an anti-inflammatory compound you can relate to. Salicylic acid is also a drug used primarily for ulcerative colitis. What's it used for? To reduce inflammation. You have a bacteria that can make its very own precursor for a pharmaceutical. Interesting, no? I hope you got an understanding of the value of this bacterium. It's not alone. There are many other wonderful health promoters which you saw earlier. They don't exist as probiotics, but you can feed them the fuels they love. When these good guys are in charge, as they should be, you stand a much better chance of living a healthy life than if the optic pathogens are determining your fate. Sadly, with all things as they are today, most people have some level of dysbiosis, which is an unhealthy balance in the bacteria in your gut. Just look around you at all the chronic degenerative disease. The microbiome is connected to all of these. We can continue down these failing paths, or we can follow the science. I've helped many people over the years by applying my principles. These people, on average, had been to see 10 practitioners before me, but to no avail. Sometimes their problems lasted many years, and yet I was able to turn their lives around in weeks or less. How is that? Welcome to a more intelligent approach. If you found this presentation informative, I have many more for free in my YouTube channel and also in the Microbiome University tab on my website, themicrobiomexpert.com. There you can select from a wide variety of topics. And if you or a loved one are struggling with a disease slash condition, I have condition-specific presentations as well, along with their microbiome protocols found within its respective tab on my website.